What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Now, on today's episode, we have got on a very interesting man. He is a financial analyst. He is the host of the Mark Moss Show, which is a syndicated radio show. And he's got a YouTube channel as well. This is Mark Moss, of course. Welcome to the show, Mark. Yeah, Zuby, thanks so much. Uh, man, I love what you do, and I'm just happy to be here today. Excited. I appreciate it, man. Likewise. So for people who are not familiar with who you are and what you do, tell them a little bit about you, Mark. Yeah. So uh, for the last several years, I've been creating content, just analyzing the markets, um, looking at what's going on and then trying to kind of forecast what will happen based off of that. I use a lot of history. I love uh, history and the lessons that it tells us. And I look at things from like a macro standpoint. Um, today, a lot of that is being driven by politics and policy. Um, people don't like to hear about politics. They just want to hear about finance, but you can't understand finance without the politics because that's what's driving it. So uh, from a macro standpoint, um, just talk about that on my YouTube channel, the radio show, like you said, and um, trying to help make sense of this crazy world. No doubt. For people who aren't super familiar with financial terms, when you say macro, what do you mean by that? I mean the big picture, right? So like the big picture. So a lot of people are like trying to pick the right stock. Like, uh, what stock should I buy? Should I buy, you know, this this crypto coin or whatever it is? But macro's looking at the bigger picture. So, for example, um, we were just talking about California, my home state, or even in, in the UK where you're from. Um, the leaders, the politicians, created policies that we should get off of fossil fuels and move to renewables. That's a political move, um, but that move has massive implications that have financial implications. So they said we should get off of fossil fuels. We should move to renewables um, by this date, a very aggressive plan. They literally shut down the fossil fuels, the natural gas, which the UK sits on massive reserves of natural gas, but they, they're not allowed to get that out of the ground now. They shut that down to move to renewables. So they set up wind, solar. Uh, the UK had a very low wind month of September. Who would have known? Uh, wind is unreliable. And now they find themselves in an energy crisis. And we've seen natural gas shoot up 800%. That's caused electricity price to go up to 400%. Uh, I think a dozen electricity companies in the UK have gone out of business. Um, and now that's leading to fertilizer shortages, which of course lead to food shortages. Um, and so you can see how that macro picture, that, that political move that was made is now having trickle down or massive, you know, financial implications. No doubt. And what was it that got you interested in this whole world to begin with? What got you interested in economics and finances? So, you know, I think part of it was just kind of growing up. I was, uh, my father was a contractor, you know, he's a, he's a, a in construction. And so I guess that's an entrepreneurial life, right? I, I kind of grew up in this entrepreneurial environment. Um, and so that probably helped. Um, life was different when we were kids. We didn't have everything. We didn't have this affluence that we have today. And so I had to kind of work and I had to kind of pay for my own things. I think that helped. Um, but really what happened was um, I started buying and selling real estate when I was 18 years old. Um, and I started making a lot of money. And over the next decade, I made a lot of money and I did really, really good for myself. I started two different businesses. I started a, a company in 2001 at the bottom of the dot-com crash um, selling e-commerce. Uh, so an e-commerce business. Um, I had a high-tech medical equipment company, sold both of those Fortune 500 exits, made a bunch of money. I thought I was living life. I thought I was uh, done. I was retired. I was married. I had a kid. Life was good. And then the 2008 great financial crash came and wiped me out. And uh, I was like, what the heck is going on here? Like, I'm pretty good at making money, but what's this whole financial casino that I don't know what's going on over here? Like um, something triggered this entire, you know, the, the global financial market to crash. Um, a lot of people that I worked with at the time have still never recovered from that, you know, even mentally. I grew up racing dirt bikes. I grew up in Southern California racing dirt bikes and surfing and snowboarding. And so um, I'm used to, I've broken all the bones in my body. I've, uh, I got limb and all, four, I got metal in all four limbs. And so I'm used to just kind of dusting myself off and like, let's, let's go again. Um, and so I figured I need to figure out what is this piece in this financial market that I don't understand. And as I started digging in, I started realizing how messed up the financial market is and it's all really being caused because of the money printer because of this unlimited money printing capacity um, and it's really what is the cause i believe of every single problem we have in the day which in today which you talk about a lot and i'm talking about from obesity to the incarceration rate to the divorce rate uh to the lockdowns to the income inequality everything is caused because of the unlimited money printing that we have 
Um, and so that's kind of what really got me motivated and uh, at least motivated to start talking about the financial system so people could start waking up to this. Because if we can beat that one thing, we can win. Mm. Man, there's so much interesting. There's so many interesting things you said there that I'm trying to work out which one I want to go into more. Uh, go, going from the beginning, how did you how did you start buying property at 18? So you know, uh, your network is your net worth, right? And that's a cliche, but it's the truth. And if I look back through my whole life, every deal that I've ever had is because it's somebody that I knew. And so uh, my friend, my best friend, my roommate at the time, I was 18. I didn't know anything about it. Um, his grandfather owned a bank. And they had like this private lending arm and he had this, uh, I'm from Southern California. So in LA, this Mexican kid didn't even speak much English. He was funding him money to go buy bank repos. So the banks had so many repos on their books. This was back in 1995. The banks had so many repos on their books. They would literally just give them to you zero money down if you'd fix them up and sell them. So this Mexican mm -hmm. kid that barely spoke English was using my friend's grandfather for you know, getting the money and had become a multimillionaire. So my, my friend's grandfather said, hey, now I've, I've helped you become a multimillionaire. Uh, take my grandson and show him the ropes. So my friend, my roommate at the time, started working with him. Um, and I saw it. Now, they didn't help me. They didn't teach me. But just seeing that it was being done was enough for me. And I went and found my own bank repo. Uh, literally, like I said, the bank gave it to me zero money down. But I still had to come up with, I think it was, I think it was an $80,000 duplex. I had to come up with I think it was $3,000 just for closing costs at the time, which I didn't have. Mm. So I pulled in a partner. We got together the $3,000. Uh, we got a couple couple credit cards, a Home Depot credit card. We literally did all the work ourselves for six months um, in between working a job. And I made like 30 grand on that first deal. And I was like, mm. bing, <laughs> like, okay. And so I just rolled that in the next deal, the next deal, the next deal, and just kind of kept it going. Wow. That's, uh, that's, that's pretty crazy, but that's interesting. And the next thing I wanted to touch on in that story is when you say that the 2008 financial crash wiped you out, was that based on you just having a lot of money in the market that time and the market crashed when you say that that, that wiped you out in what, in what sense? Because I know, I remember back to that time period, that was when I was kind of just entering the, entering the job force out of university and I know that it affected people in very different ways. For some people, it was their houses. Other people, it was kind of directly linked to them losing their jobs. Other people, it was investments. How did that specifically impact you? Yeah, so what happened is uh, I, you know, I guess I got greedy in a sense, right? So what do I mean by that? So I had, uh, like I said, I had built up a couple different businesses in different industries, an e-commerce business, a high-tech business. Um, I was in real estate as well. So I was making money in multiple businesses, which is good, multiple income strings. Warren Buffett says that you should, that's what you should do, which I was. Um, I had over 200 rental units at one point, so like individual doors. Um, so I had a lot of cash flow coming in. Uh, but I went from fixing and flipping single-family homes in Los Angeles that were like $100,000. I was in like South Central, Watts, like the areas you don't want to go. Um, and one day almost kind of got killed, uh, in the neighborhood and decided I'm never going back. I'm going to start building, uh, expensive places. I lived down on the beach, um, about an hour and a half away. And so we started building, um, from the ground up and these were $3 million, $5 million, $10 million projects. And so I ended up selling my business. I ended up selling all my rental units so I could get the capital I needed to build these big projects. Um, and so I found myself in 2008 all in. Like all in, I, I didn't have any business anymore. The business I sold, it went into real estate. I sold all my rentals and it was all in on a couple of really big projects. And I, you know, people are like, oh, what an idiot. You didn't see that coming. It's like, I didn't see it coming, but these were three to five year projects. You don't just mm -hmm. like walk away, right? From the time you buy the land and rezone all that. And so basically I was all in. Now I'm a student of history, as I said. Now um, in California, real estate had only ever crashed really one time. And that was from 89 to 92. And during that time, it crashed 30%. But the worst 12-month crash was 6%. So the worst real estate had ever crashed in California was 6% over mm -hmm. 12 months. So I said, okay, what if it was double that? What if it crashed 12%? Would I be okay? Yeah. What if it, what if it was triple the worst in history, 18%? Would I be okay? Yeah, of course. Um, mm -hmm. So I thought I was fine. I was sitting on you know twenty million dollars at a seventy percent LTV, right? So I had about thirty percent equity. So if it crashed eighteen percent, no big deal. Um, it crashed sixty percent, 
60 percent mm. in 12 months uh unprecedented never had seen anything like that in history of the whole world um and the problem is i just i couldn't carry the properties you know one of the big buildings i lost was a 12 million dollar building i think the payment was like 180 thousand a month <laughs> and uh i just couldn't carry the, the properties mm. and so i was forced to liquidate those um that one property ended up going back to the bank um i turned down an offer at 11 million ended up going back to the bank the bank sold it for four million so i was selling it for 12 the bank sold it for four that building today is worth mm -hmm. 20 million. I just couldn't hang on to it through that time. And so mm -hmm. one of the big pieces that I learned uh, of, of, of many lessons that I've learned, but one of the big lessons I've learned is uh, have a safety net. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Mm. Man, how did you get through that? Yeah, so that was devastating, as you can imagine, right? So um, all I had ever done was win, right? I, I made a, a ton of money, multiple successes in multiple industries. Um, I was just married. I built this custom home overlooking the beach, six car garage, elevator, just had my first kid, hit every goal I'd ever set. Like I was, I was on top of the world, right? And then boom, just gone, just taken from me. And not just, not just my assets, not, not just my investments, but that was my career, right? So now my career was developing real estate. So not only did I lose all my assets, I lost all my income. I lost everything, mm. um, which was obviously devastating, but you know, I just believe that uh, we can't change the past. We can only change the future, right? We're not a victim. And so the only thing to do was to go back to work, right? That's the only thing I could do. And so I did, right? I, I, I like I said, I was pretty good at making money. So like, I, I, I'm lucky to have that. And so I just went back to doing what I know how to do, which was to make money, create value for other people and, uh, and just kind of build it back up from the ground up. Mm -hmm. I, uh, did you, did you yeah. do that in the same, in the same realm, in the same real estate realm or through another channel? No, as you might imagine, at that time, real estate was done. <laughs> there was there was no mm. money to be made in real estate. And unfortunately, um, coming out of that 2009, 10, 11, even 2012 was probably the bottom of the real estate market. There was massive opportunity. Problem was, I didn't have any money. Mm -hmm. The lender that I worked with, the bank literally went out of business. It was one of the oldest banks in the United States, and they literally went out of business in that 2008 crash. So my hard money lender dried up. I mean, everything was just done. And so um, you know, as I said, I started a, an internet business back in 2001, so I was pretty good online. And I, uh, I, uh, the first thing I started doing was um, one of my friends. So back then, mortgage was still going pretty good, and one of my friends had a mortgage company, and uh, he said, "Hey, you know, you're pretty good online. Um, if you could help me generate leads, I could pay you a bunch of money for all the deals I closed, like thousands of dollars." I was like, "Okay." So literally over a weekend, I put together like a landing page. Uh, you know, like, Hey, refinance your home. You can save a bunch of money. Mm. Um, I set up a Google pay-per-click campaign to send, um, you know, pay-per-click leads to that, to that form. People would fill out the form application. They would be sent to him aut automated. Um, I set that up over a weekend. The next week I hopped on my dirt bike. I rode from California to Cabo San Lucas, rode the whole Baja Peninsula, which I have, I have a, I have a, a, a TV show, a network television show on ABC called rip to Cabo. So if anybody's interested, you can check that out. Um, I do that every year. We do it in 16 years. Anyway, hopped on my bike, rode to Cabo. I get there, I open up my laptop, I log into my thing, and it was just cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe how much money this just made. And um, I spent like 10 years, uh, I spent about a decade then doing just lead generation for companies, mm. just helping them generate leads. And so mortgage and tax and debt and mostly around the finance stuff. And I just kind of kept that going and I built up, uh, built up my war chest again and, and had to get going again. No doubt, man. That's an, that's an inspiring story because it's, it's rare and it's unique. I mean, it's rare for someone to make that much money that early and then to go through a situation that feels like it's out of their hands where they end up losing so much and then to bounce back from that. So yeah. the next thing you said that was really interesting and which I think would peak the ears of a lot of listeners was where you were talking about the money printer really being the original source of a huge number of downstream societal and even cultural problems. So can you explain what you mean by that? Because I'm sure a lot of people are thinking, hey, what's money printing got to do with divorce or obesity? So can you go into that more? Yeah, I'd love to. So uh, we could play a game. It'd be fun, fun little game. But I mean, like I said, pretty much every, every, Every problem in the world, I think, boils down to that. I, I like to use an analogy, like if there was a tree, a giant oak tree, 10,000 leaves, and every leaf on that tree was a problem, at the base, at the root of that tree would be the money printer. 
So what happens is, is people don't have a fundamental understanding of what money is. And so what happens is, um, you know, if you break things down to like first principles, so sometimes um, things are complicated and so people don't understand them and so they'll outsource their thinking to an expert. But really, if you break them down to their most basic element, they're easy to understand and then it helps you understand them on a higher level. So what is money? Well, money is communication. Money coordinates an economy. So what do I mean by that? Well, uh, in the United States, 330 million people in the world, you know, almost 8 billion people. How is it that the exact product I need can show up at the exact place I need when I need it? Uh, for this microphone, you know, there's thousands of parts inside this microphone that were made by thousands of people. How does that get coordinated? Well, it gets coordinated with the price. The price is the signal. So when prices go up, two things happen. One, people buy less. And two, people that make the parts make more that alleviates the high prices. So they say high prices are the cure for high prices. When high prices go up, people buy less and people make more of it. But what happens when you distort that signal? When, you, when the Fed in the United States dumps in $8 trillion in a year? Well, now the price signal gets completely distorted and now we don't know what to make. We don't know how to coordinate the economy. So that's a big problem. But what it also does, because we are living in a central bank economy, a debt fiat world, the money printer benefits the people at the top. So mm -hmm. they create money for themselves. It's something called the Cant um, Cantillon effect. So the Cantillon effect says that those are the closest to the money printer benefit the most. So the people at the top, that then they get it next, the banks, and then the hedge funds, institutions, they have a, they have a benefit that we don't. And so they make a way more money. And then that creates this income inequality gap. So, uh, for example, uh, in the United States, it's a big problem. We're seeing hedge funds, institutions going and buying up all the single family home. They're paying over 30% over asking price and they're pricing regular people out of homes. People can't buy homes. Mm -hmm. And now mm -hmm. they're being forced to rent from wall street. Well, people are like, that's that, that, that should be illegal. We should have a law against that. Well, what we should do is just take away the money printer because <laughs> the money printer mm -hmm. is giving those hedge funds basically free money. Um, you and I have to borrow at 3%, 4% interest, so we can't pay as much. They're getting it for almost free, right? Mm. So then that creates this income inequality, right? So they're getting way richer while the p people that are you know, at the bottom are getting poor. Why do they get poor? Well, every time the central bank creates more money, it dilutes. It makes all the existing money worth less, right? Mm. It's worth less and less. So people at the top that own assets... The, 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 they're worth more and more money. The people at the bottom that are living off of wages, their wages buy less and less and less. So that income inequality gap continues to grow. Um, what's the number one cause of divorce? Probably arguing over finance, mm -hmm. right? So the divorce rate. Um, we also talk about um, in the Bitcoin community, like fiat money, so fake government money, fiat food, right? So as um, prices continue to skyrocket, uh, manufacturers have to start looking for ways to cut corners. So instead of giving you good, healthy food, they start to put junk inside. They look for ways to cut corners. They look for ways to get more food with less effort. They start looking for ways to, uh, you know, use the land to make as much money as they can, but then they rob it of all the nutrients, uh, right? So that fiat money system then causes, you know, obesity, causes health problems, things like that. And then societal problems. So, for example, um, without a money printer, your government would never have been able to lock you down and pay you not to work. That would have never happened. Without mm -hmm. a money printer, they wouldn't be putting through some, you know, uh, digital passport system and forcing you to take things in your body you don't want to take. Right. Uh, only because they can print that money gives them the power to do that. Mm hmm. And that goes into war as well, right? Because in, in the in past, the war as well, yeah. going to war used to be extremely expensive and countries used to literally run out of money to be able to fund their wars. Whereas now you've got this whole unholy military industrial complex and they can just go to war and profit off of war and still get everyone to be funding it with their taxpayer money while they're also printing money. The, the whole thing is... It's one of those worlds where the more you know about it and the more you learn about it, the more uh, it's like this deep, dark rabbit hole, which never 
which never ends. You just look at everything and you're like, man, everything, everything is a scam. <laughs> it's like, like absolutely everything um, is a scam and people are kept in the dark about it. Yeah. And you're not even supposed to talk about it. If you talk about it, you're crazy or you're a conspiracy theorist or you're a anti-establishment or whatever. But a lot of what you're saying, I mean, these are just things that you can you can look up and you can verify. You can see that it's a handful of investment companies that own pretty much every country, like a very small number of uh, investment firms own the entire world. People think that Coca-Cola and Pepsi are competitors, but your money still ends up going to the same people. Yeah. They think all these different airlines are competitors, but your money still ends up going to the same people. It's across the entire board. Um, and I don't know, I think ignorance has always been bliss. And I understand why a lot of people don't even really want to delve into this world and attempting to understand it because it's uh, it's disheartening and it makes it feel like everything you've been <laughs> everything you've been taught and a lot of the narratives out there you just learn that so much of it is just is just nonsense and manipulation. Yep. Yeah, on my YouTube videos, I typically like to start out and I say I'm trying to change the way you think about money because everything you've learned is wrong. So kind of like mm. what you said, um, I sent out a tweet maybe a month or two ago. It was after the Afghanistan thing. Um, and I was, man, that was, I knew how bad that thing was, but it was just like, oh, it was just so bad. I was just having a real tough time with that. And I put out a tweet and I said, sometimes I wish I would have just taken the blue pill. Um, and that's yep. obviously back to the matrix thing, which is uh, the red pill. You see everything, the blue pill, you go back to sleep. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. you can't unsee what you've seen. And to your point, you know, sometimes ignorance is bliss. I mean, I don't really hope that, but sometimes I look at those people and they're just like sleepwalking through life. Like, obviously, I know what side you, you know, you're on a lot of these issues. You're very vocal about that. Um, and it makes you sad or anxious or angry that these policies are being put into place. But then half the people want them. They're yeah. happy about it. And sometimes mm -hmm. it's like, man, couldn't I just be happy about it? So like, that's the kind of sleepwalking <laughs> through, like they're happy about it, but they just don't know. They're like happy sheep going to the slaughter kind of a thing. Yeah, well, honestly, and I don't say this to be disparaging, but one thing I've really learned is that a lot of people don't do much thinking. Like they don't really think like critically, really, really think about stuff. You use the term I often use, right? They, they outsource their thinking to other people, whether it's politicians or the media just tells them exactly what to believe and even how to act. And whether you're talking about money or you're talking about nutrition and health or you're talking about relationships or any just anything that's important, even science itself, medicine itself, people are programmed to just accept one thing, don't question, don't challenge, don't think people are actually, I mean, one thing I come under fire for a lot is thinking, yeah. <laughs> right? It's yeah. literally for, for thinking, for, for asking questions. I don't know the answer to everything. I'm just simply trying to get to the truth. I'm trying to get to the bottom of, Hey, what's, what's going on, right? No one's talking about this thing. Why aren't we talking about this thing? Wait, this doesn't make sense. The narrative is saying X, but I'm looking at the data and it's saying not X or it's saying Y. Can we, yep. can we talk about this? Um, and yeah, and, and it's really odd that this is also happening in the Western world. That's one of the things that's been really disturbing for me is that the, the power of the Western world countries like the UK, USA, Canada, Australia, so on and so forth. The thing that so many people always took pride in, at least at a surface level was this notion of freedom and liberty and the ability to question and challenge and to not, you know, be an individual and not have to just go along with everything. But it seems like that's all being inverted and it's going back to this very collectivist, authoritarian, um, just, you know, look at the top and trust, trust the leaders, trust the experts, you know, trust the guys in the lab coats, whatever. Don't ask them any questions. It doesn't matter if they don't make sense or they're contradicting themselves or they're being hypocritical. You know, thou shalt not ask any questions questions and yeah. all of that has been just just worrying for me especially when the actions that they are taking and the rhetoric that they're putting out there is causing real very tangible problems for normal everyday people um, economically 
in terms of their relationships, in terms of their health, both physical and mental. Uh, you're seeing the unemployment jacking up. You're seeing the inflation jacking up. And as you already mentioned, um, you know, we know who inflation is going to impact the most. And one of the things that's been very, very strange about it is because I have all these concerns and I'm voicing all these concerns. I'm not someone who is or has ever been traditionally, let's say, left wing, right? The whole purpose of the left wing historically was to look out for the poorer people and look out for the smaller guys and, you know, make sure that these gigantic wealth transfers aren't taking place. And, you know, what, what's been happening is all these big businesses have been raking in all these billions and billions. You're having companies coming and uh, buying up all these properties, as you've mentioned. And all of this is actually putting at a disadvantage the people who I thought all these individuals and even parties were supposed to be looking out for and caring about. I mean, it's not politicians and people in the media. I mean, none of them have taken a pay hit. None of them have taken a pay cut throughout this entire 20 months, right? They've in fact earned more and more money. Meanwhile, you've had hundreds of millions of people put out of work, forced to shut their business, whether they own a gym, a barber shop, an ice cream shop, whatever, you know, they were just deemed you're non-essential. Um, and even the people who they were calling essential, who they were calling heroes last year, they now want to fire them. Unless they uh, take a particular injection, right? You're there saying that, hey, uh, hospitals are being overwhelmed. There's a deadly pandemic, blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, you're firing thousands and thousands of nurses, thousands of police officers, threatening uh, the livelihoods of firefighters, all of these people who you were just calling heroes less than a year ago. And the fact that more people don't see that, I mean, I do know that a lot of people do see it, but the fact that at this stage, not everybody is seeing that and going, wait, hang on, what the heck is going on? Um, I don't know. That's weird to me. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 weird. It's, it's problematic. And I think there's a couple things going on. Um, to your point, yeah, a lot of people don't want to think for themselves. Uh, Henry Ford, he was a very quotable guy. Um, he said, uh, thinking is such hard work. That's why so few people do it. Um, and I love that quote of him. Um, but we're also being told by, you know, media today, don't think. Um, they've literally put out pieces that said, don't do your own research. Yes. <laughs> they, they, they literally told you that. Um, and so they're telling people not to do that. And what I've found, and you might have seen the same thing, but almost the more educated people become, the more they tend to just kind of trust these experts. Um, mm. But the other thing is that they've, um, so not only have they taught us not to think or not do our own research, but they've also, um, you know, basically shut down the ability to have this free and open dialogue. And I believe the truth wins because it's the truth. I believe truth is found through open dialogue, right? And mm -hmm. so um, only through open and honest discussion can you find that. And now today, they're even getting even crazier, which is now they're saying, um, like a doctor, for example, that goes against the consensus, or they're saying any scientist that goes against the consensus could be uh, doctors could be just, uh, you know, taking their license away, but scientists, you know, and if they go, go with the consensus, but um, when the Wright brothers invented the airplane, the scientific consensus was that no man would ever fly. Of course. So if they would have gone with the consensus, <laughs> like, um, we, we never would have gotten anywhere. Um, and so, you know, taking that ability to do that is, is a problem. And you mentioned, you know, the individual and you mentioned a couple things, uh, left and right, left wing. I think you're talking about liberalism. Um, and I think we get lost in a lot of these labels with socialism and fascism and communism and left and right and capitalism and whatever. And I think if I look at it on two ends of the spectrum, there's individualism and there's there's collectivism. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the United States was, you know, become the greatest example of a country in the history of the world because it was based off of like rugged individualism. Mm -hmm. And people think that that's selfish. But the reason why individualism is important is that the way that we have progress throughout the world is you see a problem and you come up with a unique solution for it. I see a different solution or I see a different problem altogether. And because we're different, we're seeing different problems, we're seeing different solutions and we're ideating and we're solving problems, we're, we're creating this progress. If everybody's the same <laughs> and there's no dialogue back and forth, there's no creativity, how is there ever going to be any progress? How will there ever be any solutions being presented? And so it really puts the world into this, uh, you know, very dangerous place, which is why like China uh, being, you know, one of the most communist countries in the last 50, 60 years couldn't compete on the global stage. 
And even mm. today, they're literally stealing the technology from the United States because they don't have the creativity that's needed. And they don't have the creativity because they've lacked free speech. They've lacked individualism. Yeah, it's weird. Ch China has this strange um, combination these days of a sort of state capitalism mixed with communism, which uh, makes them quite quite a quite a force in uh in many ways they've kind of got so many tentacles in d all these different countries and different organizations and governments and things like that and i don't know how deep it all goes but um if you see what they're look, doing in different continents it, but, whether it's yeah but look at it like this right so china under mao became like the you know the super strict communist country and they fell behind the world they couldn't compete and so in the 80s they opened up a little bit of capitalism. They opened up a little bit of free ports, a little bit of free trade. And the capitalism, capitalism is so successful that it can overcome even in spite of the government. So you look at, you know, some of the countries in, you know, Northern Europe, they like to throw out Sweden and Denmark and Norway, et cetera. But even the United States, I mean, we're pretty much taken over by the government. But even in spite of the government capitalism, or I should say, I don't, maybe that word's dirty now, just the free market entrepreneurs, um, entrepreneurs operating in a free market can overcome even that. So even in China, where there's just a little bit of free market, it's still enough to overcome the communist side that's there. Now, imagine if it was just unleashed, how much good it could do for the world. 100%. Mark, what is the way forward on this? So if we were, uh, if, if we were going to use a movie analogy, um, we'll use the Star Wars analogy. So the Star Wars was fighting back against the Empire. Um, I think uh, most people, well, if they're paying attention, if they're listening to your show, they're paying attention. And so I think they realize that um, uh, maybe World War III isn't uh, China versus the U.S. or whatever, Russia. It's the people against the globalists, right? I think that's, that's what's shaping up, right? Um, and I think if the people are trying to fight against the Empire, Kind of like in Star Wars, um, the, they had to go to the Death Star. The Death Star was what had that. And when when they went in to attack the Death Star, if you guys are old enough to know the movie, um, there was one part on top of that Death Star that they had to shoot. And if we could get in there and, just, and hit that one target, then the Death Star falls apart and the whole empire crumbles. And to me, that one part, the one piece we have to defeat is the money printer. That's the single source of all their power, all the distortion and everything. And so um, that is the solution to me. Uh, we have to defeat the money printer. I believe there's only one way to do that. We have to take away their ability to, uh, to do that. One of my favorite economists, F.A. Hayek, he said in the 80s, he's a Nobel uh, Prize winning economist. He said in the 80s, there shall never be another sound money again until the thing is taken from the hands of the government. But it can't be taken by force, rather by a sly roundabout way, introducing something that cannot be stopped. And I believe that was introduced a decade ago. I believe we have the ability to take the money printer out of the hands of the government today. Of course, I'm talking about Bitcoin. Um, some people may want to think more about a decentralized revolution. But I think that is the answer. If we can take away their ability to um, continue to march us towards this authoritarian uh, world, um, then we win. Mm. What do you say to people who are so skeptical that they believe Bitcoin itself is the currency of the globalists? Yeah, I think that's an easy one. That's a very easy one. And the reason why it's easy is because, <laughs> oh, it's an easy one to answer. Uh, and the reason why it's easy to answer is because Bitcoin is an open source network. It's open source. Anybody can go on and view the code. There's thousands and thousands and thousands of coders working on the platform. Anybody, it's so it's open and it's permissionless. Anybody could just join it and start building on it. And so um, every other thing, of course, like the Federal Reserve, but every other cryptocurrency, you know, they have these proprietary pieces where you don't really see all the code. Maybe there's a backdoor hidden, something like that. But Bitcoin's open. We know it. It's open source. Everybody can see the code. So what you're saying is that Bitcoin is not a scam that's going to give all your money to globalists and the CCP. I would say it's, it, 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 it's the exact opposite. <laughs> it's the exact opposite. Yeah, because it's open source, we know there's no code. And because it's decentralized nature, nobody can mm -hmm. control it. So you mentioned the CCP. Um, everybody said, well, China controls over half of the mining. They could do a, a, an attack. Well, they did do an attack. Uh, a couple of months ago, they literally kicked all the miners out of the, out of the country, literally shut down half of the network. But the network didn't skip a beat. Yep, no doubt. Man. 
What do you think is the biggest challenge to Bitcoin? Um, I think the big, what I would say the biggest challenge to Bitcoin is people's own perception. Mm. What do I mean by that? I think people expect way too much, way too soon. So if, uh, if we were out in the forest and I showed you this brand new oak tree that, you know, just sprouted and I'm said, Hey, Zub, look at this, look at this oak tree. One day it's going to be this giant oak tree. You're like, come on, Mark, that's stupid. Look how small it is. Well, it takes time, man. It takes time to evolve. And so like people think that, well, Bitcoin has failed because it's not a, a stable medium of exchange today. It's like, dude, we're literally changing the way the world works. And we've got here in 10 years. Like, so be patient. So I think that's probably the number one thing is people, uh, one, they, uh, two things. So one, they, they expect too much too soon. And two, um, we're in it. This is a technological revolution. And this is a big difference. It's a, a new technology is like an iPhone or Uber. Those are technologies. Mm -hmm. A technological revolution is different. They happen every 50 years or about on a 50 year cycle. A technological revolution is something so big that it changes the way the world works and it creates financial markets. So we had industrial revolution. We had steam engines and steel. We had electricity. We had oil and automobiles. We had the microprocessor. Those all change humanity. All right. Today, Bitcoin is a technological revolution. It will change the way the entire world works. Um, and so what happens is when we have a new technology like electricity, Hey, Zoop, check out this electricity. You're like, oh, yeah, it's kind of like a digital candle. What do I need a digital candle for? Candles have worked fine for 5,000 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, yeah, candles have worked fine for 5,000 years, but uh, electricity will be way more than that eventually, right? And so what happens is people go, oh, yeah, Bitcoin, it's like digital cash, sure. Oh, it's like digital gold, okay, sure. Um, yeah, it is those things, yes, but it's creating an entire new network that will enable things to happen in this world that we've never seen and will literally change the way the world works um i can give you a couple if we have time but if not um that's yeah go ahead man no nope. yeah please do man go ahead go ahead so um if again if we break things down to the most basic right so um charlie munger warren buffett's partner says show me the incentives i'll show you the outcome so we have this incentive structure. A lot of people think that, uh, I get this from Jimmy Song in his book, uh, Thank God for Bitcoin. He says that a lot of people think money is neutral. It's a tool. Money can be used for good. Money can be used for bad. Well, the fiat money mm -hmm. system, that's not true. The fiat money system is a system built on theft, lies, and deceit. Theft, inflation is theft. When they print more money, they're stealing value from you. Um, Lies and deceit. We don't know how much money they have. We don't know how much money they're going to have tomorrow. They lie to us about inflation, right? So it's built on theft, lies, and deceit. So anything built on that system is inherently evil. Um, and what happens is it changes the incentive structure. So now people are incentivized to cheat, right? They're incentivized to print more money and give it to their friends. They're incentivized to do these things. Um, and think about your own government, for example. So your government can only tax you so much before you'll revolt. So it's, mm. they'll, instead, they'll only tax you to 50, 60 percent, um, and then they'll, they'll steal the rest through inflation, right? What if, and now in the United States, they're talking about um, taxing under wealth. I mean, that's insan insane. Mm -hmm. um, they're talking about lowering the death transfer benefit. So like if you transfer more than a million dollars, you lose half of it. I mean, insane things, right? Mm. But what if, what if the government couldn't just take your wealth? What if they couldn't steal it from you? Well, that changes the incentive structure. So now let's see, the government would actually be forced to provide me a valuable good or service in exchange for my money. See how that shifts the incentive structure of the entire world? If I can't just go create more money from thin air and I can't just go seize it from your bank account, well, shoot, if I can't, if I can't counterfeit it or steal it, I guess I'm forced to provide a good and a value in the marketplace. Think about how that changes the world. And then think about um, probably the oldest problem that humanity has had is how do I store my wealth, my energy? So I burn you know, calories to dig a hole. If I work for four hours, I get enough supplies to live for the day. If I work eight hours, I can store a little bit of that energy to be used later. Um, but if I store energy, I have cattle, um, you know, in the, the oldest man, you're going to come steal my goats. So you and I band together and someone may come take our goats and chickens. So we make a village and we make a kingdom and we make a country. And if I stored gold and I had a lot of gold, I'd have to build this big safe and this big wall and I have to hire armed guards. It would cost me all this time and money to secure it, secure my wealth. 
But what if I could secure all my wealth cryptographically that cost me zero dollars to store and it's portable and I can take it with me everywhere I go? It, it removes the oldest problem in the history of the world. Now, what does that mean? I don't know, but I would imagine it's pretty massive when you think about that over a long enough time frame. Yeah, absolutely. How did you first get into uh, the world of Bitcoin? When did you just discover it and how were you sold on the whole concept and idea? So uh, remember after 2008, I was like, I got wiped out. I'm like, I'm pretty good at making money, but what's this whole financial casino? So as I started learning about it, um, there's two things that really inspired me. The first was I learned a concept and a concept is uh, money is like energy. It doesn't disappear. It transfers. So when I lost my wealth in 2008, someone else got it. So I didn't like that. And so I, I started learning, okay, how do these wealth transfers work? What times do they show up? Because I want to be on the receiving end of those wealth transfers from now on. And so they happen. There's different ways and times that they show up. Um, and then I also started learning about the financial system and I became a gold bug. I learned that it was this monetary policy that creates these problems. And if we had a sound money like gold, we could fix this. And so you hear these gold bugs, they've been talking about this forever. And we got off the gold standard in 1971. And so since then, basically the whole world has gone off the rails in, in 50 years, August was the 50 year anniversary. Um, and so I became this gold bug and, um, I also was, you know, really, I, I started seeing the kind of country kind of go down this tailspin. By 2012, I got really disillusioned with the whole uh, political scene. Obama took office and wanted to fundamentally change America, these things. Um, and I kind of gave up on politics and I kind of gave up on everything. And I figured, I, I don't want to be a freedom fighter. I'll just go live on a beach in South America and fish and surf every day. Um, but when <laughs> I, um, I was in the process, um, I was, uh, I was listening to this guy named Sovereign Man, and uh, he's all about being a sovereign man. Like, you wouldn't put all your money into one stock, would you? Why would you have your whole life in one country? Hmm, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. Why would I have my whole life in one country that could just seize all my assets? So why not diversify? Why not have multiple bank accounts across the country and store gold and have land and stuff in, in multiple countries? So I started working on it's called like a multi-flag theory kind of a thing. Um, and I was in the process in 2015 of actually setting up a bank account in Panama. I could then work into residency and then a citizenship. Um, and I took another look at Bitcoin in 2015. And I said, well, this is the same thing. I can get my money out of the banking system in a way they can't seize it, steal it, inflate it away. Um, and so I did. So I bought it. And as I started learning more about it, I thought, we actually have a tool to win. So you see like uh, libertarians or anarchists or whatever, you know, talking about changing the world and how we can have this libertarian world, but they have no solution for that. And Bitcoin is the tool. Bitcoin is actually a tool that we can use. And in my opinion, in my view, and I've been studying this for now seven or eight years, it's the only tool that I can see. It's the only solution that I can find that, that solves that. Mm. And when it comes to the world of uh, cryptocurrency, are you Bitcoin only? Or do you think that there's a role for some of these other cryptocurrencies to play in all this? So that's a great question. So the one thing I'll say is uh, in 2016, I started writing a cryptocurrency research newsletter. And for four years, I wrote research on all the different crypto projects. Um, over those four years, I probably researched and published over a thousand pages of research on cryptocurrencies. Um, the mm -hmm. more that I learned, the more that I realized that I think Bitcoin is the only solution. So a lot of people are like, Mark, you don't know what the hell you're talking about. Well, have you published a thousand pages of research? Because I have. Um, and what I would say is a couple things. If I think the people that chase cryptocurrency are just different than the Bitcoin people. So I believe Bitcoin is a tool to win. It's the battle of humanity. The world is moving towards authoritarianism. And with technology, uh -huh. social credit score systems, central bank digital currencies, you know, the passports, they literally have the tool they need to probably lock us in lock us down for the rest of eternity. Um, but if we win here, if Bitcoin wins here, we could have freedom for the rest of eternity. I believe the battle yes. for humanity is right here. And if we don't win right now in the next year or two, like it's over. So the people that chase cryptocurrency, I mean, they want to make more dollars and great, you know, go make more dollars and increase your stack. And that's all cool. And that's the people that people say, oh, but you don't know how much money I made. Well, I'm not trying to make more money. I'm trying to save the world. And so I think there's a difference. And, and what I would say is that going back to, we talked about this, the, the problem is the money printer, unlimited money supply. Another big problem that we have is censorship, not just censorship in that, I can't say what I want on Facebook or YouTube, but censorship that my money is stolen away through inflation. Also, if I wanna give money to a person, they could stop that, block that, prevent it. 
So I'm censored mm -hmm. even in my wealth. Um, that's a problem. And then the, a really big problem, which still goes back to the money printer, is that we used to be a nation ruled by law. So like the Constitution is easy to understand. Everybody understands it. And I can set my life. I can plan my whole life based off those laws. But today we're not ruled by law. We're ruled by men who constantly change the rules on us all the time. We were talking offline and I was saying, I, I kind of want to move back to California. That's where I'm from. But like, I don't know what the laws will be there next month. Like, how can I plan my life on that? And so those mm. are three big problems. And I think, I think solutions come to problems. So we need a solution that has a fixed supply cap, not unlimited. We need a solution that has, yep. um, has immutable law, not governance, and it's censorship resistant. Mm -hmm. And if, if, if for me, those are the three problems that need to be solved. And if I look at the 10,000 or whatever cryptocurrencies out there, I see only one that provides those three solutions. Now others can, you know, they can pay you an 8% yield and, you know, they'll go up a thousand percent, whatever. I'm just not optimizing for that. I hear that totally, man. Man, you know, there's something you said there that really gave me a chill, but it's also the way that I'm feeling, which is that we're very much on a precipice and that there is a battle and people don't even know that. Or if they are aware to some degree, there's a lot of people who <laughs> they think the battle is something totally different to what it actually is. Um, and I've just never witnessed something like this in my life. And I'm sure this is part of the cycle of humanity. I'm sure even in the last hundred years, there have been times where people also felt that, you know, humanity is on the brink and actually perhaps they were correct. I mean, if you look at World War II or you, you know, the spread of Nazism, the spread of communism, I mean, if you had allowed those ideologies to totally win and take over the world, then, um, you know, what would things have looked like a couple decades from then? And I do think that this whole situation is way more, it's way more serious than people realize. And yeah. we've been outspoken on it, right? We've been talking about whether it's the, the, the lockdowns or the mandates or this and that. And one thing I'm noticing all the way through this is that a lot of people just are not able to see beyond the immediate thing right in front of them. They yeah. can't see the next steps. They can't see the second order, third order, fourth order consequences of the thing they're doing. You know, they're like, oh, it's just a mask. It's just two weeks. It's just yeah. this. It's just that. Like it's always been, it's just, it's just, it's just. Even yeah. when you've got the police now out in certain countries with boots on the ground, harming people physically, forcing people in their houses, doing all of this clearly unethical stuff, people losing their jobs, being threatened, being fired, families being broken up, relationships being destroyed, all of this supposedly to combat a virus with, you know, uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, well over 99% survival rate in the vast majority of the population, according to all statistics. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense on the face of it. And I wish people would understand that better. There's a couple of things I'd like to say. First thing I would just say real quickly is um, it, um, you know, if you, if you were, if you're going to debate somebody, you should know their argument better than your own. So you have to, and then Sun Tzu would tell you, you know, the art of war would say, know your enemy, right? You have to understand who your enemy is. And so um, understand who these globalists are and they tell you exactly the world they're trying to build. So um, Klaus Schwab wrote two books that I would highly recommend you read COVID-19, the great reset. And then he wrote another book called the fourth industrial revolution. If you read those books, so Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum, kind of the head of this globalist movement, he wrote two books and he tells you the world that he's building. So uh, don't take Zuby and I's word for it. Go read what he said. Another book that I'd recommend is uh, Mark Carney, maybe one of the most influential people in the world. Um, he wrote a book called Values. Read that book. He says, people need to understand the future is not going to be better. The future is going to be worse. People have to understand they won't be able to travel as much. They won't be able to drive their cars like this is the world that they're promising you. And they're the ones that are building it. So uh, it's not a conspiracy. <laughs> go go take their word for it. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is um, you mentioned uh, how people have probably felt like this before in history. Um, and you're right. And you said about 100 years ago. Well, actually, every 84 years, there's a cycle. So um, although progress goes exponential, um, it repeats. Right. And so every 84 years, there's something called a regime change or a populist uprising cycle. So 84 years ago today, approximately, was the end of World War II, 
Hitler, Mussolini, and in the U.S., we had the FDR New Deal, kind of turned the U.S. into socialist country. 84 years before that was Karl Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, led to the European Spring, largest revolution in European history. Now, 84, every 84 years you have this, three times 84 equals 252. Every 250 years, there's a revolution cycle. So 250 years ago was the American French Revolution. 250 years before that was the Protestant Reformation. Now, um, so this is repeating over and over. Humankind, you know, mankind wants to oppress. People have too much. They revolt. They overthrow. They have freedom. Uh, oppression builds up so much. They revolt, overthrow freedom. And that's the cycle as far back as we can go. And it happens mm -hmm. on this 250 year time frame. What's important about uh, to understand about that is that um, two things. One, it shows that um, we get to this point of uh, peak globalization or peak centralization. In the American Revolution, the people rejected the centralization of the monarchy and set up a decentralized government. The United States is a republic, a decentralized government. I mean, so what it shows us is that um, people get fed up, they have too much, and they revolt and they push back. Um, and I think that's, a, and, and it also shows that we win over and over. And I think we can see right now that we're at, or at least almost at peak globalization, um, right? The whole world's locking down. They're trying to take away all your freedom, uh, even your own private property rights of your own personal body. Um, and mm -hmm. we're also seeing people are pushing back on that all throughout the world. There's people pushing back against that. Um, and I think we're at the peak. And, and again, the cycles tell us we're right at that peak where that happens. Um, and I believe that we win, but it's critical, man. It's at a critical juncture. Now, um, it's at a critical juncture. There's a, if we have time, I'll tell you one other thing. We have a couple more minutes. Yeah, go ahead, man. So um, these revolution cycles work on this like 250 year time frame. Then I was uh, talking about these technological revolutions work on a 50 year time frame, And then the financial revolution cycles work on an 80 year time frame. So they're all different, but all three of those are converging right now. And why is that important? Well, at the time when the world is facing peak centralization and it's pushing back and it wants to go to decentralization on a 50 year time frame, we're in a technological revolution. What is that? It's a decentralized revolution giving mm -hmm. us the technology, exactly what we need to defeat the problem that we have at hand. Remember, solutions come to problems. And then technological revolutions drive financial markets. So the last 50 years has been dominated by tech companies. Before that, it was automobile companies. Before that, it was oil and electricity companies, right? And so um, the financial system is ready to be reset. 80 years ago was the Bretton Woods Agreement where the whole world agreed to go on a gold standard. Today, the IMF is calling for a Bretton Woods II, meaning they're ready to reset the financial system. So all this is lining up right now. And, uh, and yeah, people don't understand how important this is that we win here. Because I believe, as I said, this, as far back as you go through history, we can see the cycle just repeats, 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 repeats. I mm -hmm. think the cycle is going to be broken. And it's either going to be broken where we go into this permanent totalitarian state and with technology, they prevent any type of uprising forever, or the decentralized revolution that's here gives us what we need. We win and the cycle is broken on the side of freedom. And that's what I'm choosing. That's what I, that's what I think happens. So the moral of the story is to buy Bitcoin. Well, um, you know, Part if, of you it. Think, if, <laughs> if you think if you think there's another option that I mean, it, I think as I think as long, you know, a gold bug, for example, sees the same mm -hmm. problem. <clears throat> we yes. have to take away the the, the 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 central authority to create money from thin air. So um, if you have another solution that you think um, helps achieve that. So like uh, we're both warriors. I like to shoot a bow and arrow. You like to swing an axe. OK, that's fine. Let's go attack the same person. Um, I guess, you know, in my opinion, I think there's one weapon, but if you think that gold's better, great. But I think we still see the same problem. We still want to attack the same thing. We still want to increase people's awareness of that um, and bring attention to that because that's how the change happens. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it's, um, man, I, I mean, this, this past 20 months now, although it's been so concerning, it's for anyone who has been paying attention it's been a real lesson in human psychology, for one, um, and the the true nature of government and the importance of individual sovereignty and not just having one source of income and being totally reliant on whether it's the government or a corporation that you work for or whatever, thinking that they love you and they care about you and they're always looking out for you, I mean. I feel like every myth that exists in modern Western society has been dispelled in a very rapid period of time. 
uh, down to notions uh, like liberty and individual rights and civil liberties, all of that stuff. People have seen how quickly that can be disintegrated and how willingly people will give it up if they're scared. If you scare people, just how, I mean, people, the enthusiasm for tyranny is the worst part of all of this to me. Yeah. It's not simply the, it's not just, it's not the fact that to me, I'm like, look, government is going to government. Just like I say, vi- a virus is going to virus. A government is going to government. Um, but what's has been disheartening, but also encouraging on the flip side, because seeing people pushing back against it is just the number of people who are, who are okay with it, not just okay, but who advocate for it. When I'm seeing people openly, openly advocating for segregation, openly um, you know, suggesting that people should be, you know, denied health care or banned yeah. from uh, banned from whether it's a restaurant or a gym or even a grocery store unless they take a pharmaceutical product. All of this stuff is very, very, very disturbing and saddening. I've heard a lot of really, really bad stories as someone who's got a, a big following and who speaks on this a lot. I'm sure you get the same. I've heard some really heartbreaking individual stories from at this point, thousands, <laughs> at least over a thousand people, you know, individual stories. And I can only think of how many millions or billions of them are out there. And it doesn't, um, it's not right. A lot of people don't like to use the term evil, but to me, it's very evil and it's very sinister, a lot of what has gone on. And I think it's even more sinister that it's all um, gone under the guise of, hey, we're doing this for you, right? We're doing this to, to help you and protect you. And this is for your health. It doesn't matter if we're uh, beating you up in the street because you won't put a mask on or because you're outside your house. Like that's, that's all for your own good, sir. That's all for your yeah. own health. And then seeing yeah. other people saying like, yeah, well, you know, they should have followed the rules. And I'm like, dude, you know, people wonder how uh, in the 20th century we went through all these horrible things. And but you see the same psychology at play. You see the same propaganda at play. You see the same demonization, the same rationalization for awful acts. Yeah. And I just don't want things to get as bad as I know they could, because just last year, I mean, this time last year, I was warning that some of the stuff that is going on now could happen. And people were calling me crazy. People were calling me a conspiracy theorist saying that, oh, that can't happen in the UK. That can't happen in the USA. We're not North Korea. We're not. People were, I was like, dude, like if you continue down this line, then some of this stuff is just, is just inevitable. So people need to hit the brakes on it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's insane to think about how far and how fast we've come, but at the same time, we've been warned about this for hundreds of years in all types of books. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, a couple of things I was thinking as you were talking, one, um, everyone's so afraid, right? Um, nothing good was ever gained without risk. So, um, you know, the pilgrims coming to the new world, I mean, they literally risked their life to do that. Um, people moving, you know, to the West Coast, settling that, literally risked their life, going to the moon. Um, I mean, you name it. Anything that was ever done was done with, with risk, not being safe. The other thing I was thinking is that history books are tell the story over and over and over. So there's definitely a failure of the education system um, where um, you can see, you know, every time this has happened, and like you said, the same things happening in Russia, Germany, um, China, um, hundreds of millions of people have died, but they all died because they obeyed. They didn't die because they disobeyed. They Mm. all died because they obeyed. And so Mm. um, what I love about what you're doing and reaching so many people and what I'm trying to do as well is, um, is just wake people up to this and, um, you know, it's important to understand that it only takes a tiny minority. I think it was James Madison said it just takes a small minority to continue to light brush fires in the minds of men. Um, and so if we can get 5% of the people to kind of wake up or 10% of the people to wake up and rise up, we mm. win. It's, it's, it's not that hard. And, uh, and we're making an impact and, and we're doing it. Um, and I'm hopeful. I'm not, I'm not a doom and gloom guy. I think we win. I oh, yeah, me too. Great. Um, I think the future is great, um, but you know, unfortunately, we got some stuff to go through right now, and it's not going to be fun. Absolutely, no. I think we win, but I think that people have, are so complacent, right? I think that people think that they can just hide and let you and me do all the dirty work, or you know, let a handful of people, uh, you know, speak. 
I'm like, look, man, if people want this to end, people need to speak. I've been saying this before there was even any any pandemic situation. I was like when I was seeing stuff going sideways in other regards, I was like, look, you need to speak up. All these all these yeah. DMs you're sending me or things you're whispering in my ear, like don't tell me, like tell it to the world. Tell it to your employer. Tell it to the people you're if you're in school. Say it out loud, right? You can tell me. I can't I can't do anything, right? Like I'm I can't fight every single fight for every individual. But you ever see there was this video, um, I don't know how viral it went, but there was like a video of like a concert, like an outdoor grass area at a concert, and one person gets up and dances and everyone's like laughing, mm-hmm. oh, what an idiot. But eventually mm-hmm. he doesn't care, and eventually another person gets up and dances and then another and finally mm-hmm. the whole crowd's up dancing, right? And I think like what you're saying and what you're doing, um, there's a lot of people DMing you, right? But how many people retweet it? Right. And so like True. somebody has to be first. Somebody has to be that example. And then other people will follow along. And so you're saying stuff and people are retweeting it. Right. And so um, you're getting people to join in. And I think True. you're I mean, you're doing an amazing job and uh, you're getting people to retweet it, getting people to share it. And that's the first easy step. Oh, I could just click a button. Right. I didn't say it. Zuby mm-hmm. said it um, kind mm-hmm. of a thing. Um, but then they start <laughs> saying, well, but you know what I mean? Like yeah, uh, yeah. you're helping that movement start. It's easy. Like, Oh, well, I didn't really mean that. I just retweeted. I didn't think about it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it I'm not paid. Them, I'm right? not paid. I'm not paid enough for this, man. But eventually, eventually <laughs> they start doing it on their own. And I think, I mean, I think in, and I, I know what you're saying, like, uh, getting people to speak up, but it is, I think it is, I think it is beneficial. Mm. It is helping. Oh, it, it definitely, man. I know that it is. I know that it is. Man, Mark, it's been so good to talk to you. You're a dude. I know we could we could talk about so many subjects for such a long period of time. But yeah, for people who want to check you out and follow what you're doing, where's the best place for them to go? Yeah, well, we definitely will talk about more because I'm going to have you on my show next. And so we'll get into some more fun stuff. But um, yeah, uh, I make a couple videos a week on YouTube. You can just search Mark Moss. Um, you can search uh, on any of your podcast um, players. Just search Market Disruptors or Mark Moss and you'll find me there as well. Um, and I'm on Twitter, onemarkmoss.com, or I'm on Twitter, just one Mark Moss. So that's it. Awesome, man. Mark, thank you so much for coming on the show, bro. We appreciate you. Thanks, Zuby.